Amen. Y'all can be seated. Hey, good morning. It's good to see you today. Um, if you're new here with us, uh, we're in the book of Romans together as we've just been talking about. And uh, in the first eight chapters, Paul talks about like in explicit detail what it means to have a saving faith, a faith that actually leads to the salvation of your soul, and a comfort and a security that God will come through uh, for us. And then the last half of the book, uh, starting in chapter 9, he goes on to talk about what this looks like in community and what it looks like to apply the faith uh, to our lives. Have you ever found it difficult to have unity with other believers? I, I can stay here all day until we all. I have. It requires humility. It requires care for others, which is why it is so difficult. Those things don't come natural to us. For instance, on kind of a serious note here, there's a pretty significant church unity issue that's uh, borderlining church discipline, uh, and we've been dealing with it uh, here at New City for almost a decade now, and I've been talking to other pastors from other churches in the area, they're dealing with it, even consulting pastors around the globe, it's, it's, uh, it's a global crisis, and, and here's what's happening. In churches all throughout the world, people are attempting to live in unity, seeking to have fluid and helpful conversations with one another, even seeking to live as the family of God outside of Sunday gatherings. But there's this faction of people in every single church that just refuses to seek first the kingdom of God. Who are these people? These people are green bubble, rebel loving, tech idolatrous Android users. <laughs> this is when your tech guy that makes the slides is an Android user. This is, what, this is what happens right there. That's funny. That's good. We that walk in the light want you to know that not height nor depth, green bubble or blue bubble, will be able to keep us from loving you. The elders and I now have a protocol during the elder interviews to help guide us with wisdom and discernment as we continue to run across the issue. And what I want you to know as your pastor uh, is this, is that I love you. You are the entire reason I have grouped me on my phone, all right? I'm kind of kidding here, just kind of. Um, of course, we don't want uniformity of a church. As a church, that's not what we're talking about here. In fact, churches that uh, demand uniformity uh, usually turn into being cults, right? Uh, and so what we want is unity, and that's what today is all about. So the matter at hand and, and the first thing we need to talk about is the context of, of why Paul wrote this in Romans 14. Is we, we have to ask the question, what's the, what's the issue in the Roman church? And once we ask that question, then we can say, what's the issue in our context? How did the issue of unity arise to the level that Paul needed to address it? Well, Christians kept passing judgment toward other Christian, uh, Christians on matters that he called disputable matters. In the context of this church, it was likely many Jewish Christians who were troubled by these new Roman Gentile Christians and the freedom that they had to eat things that Jewish Christians used to never eat, right? Uh, and drink things that they used to never eat and, and not observe certain days that they used to observe. And, and it had become such a big issue that these convictions were affecting the entire church body. And Paul says, listen, it's not necessary that we put those on the top tier. So while their context is not going to be the same as our context today, we all too have things that we hold with different grips that affect our unity as the body of Christ, here at New City even. And so today Paul's going to guide us through the problem of our unity, then he's going to show us the power of true unity, and then he's going to begin to chart a path toward unity as we move forward together as God's people. So here's our big idea today. Everyone... I repeat, everyone has a responsibility to fulfill when it comes to the unity of the church. In fact, the, the, if you're a member here at New City, one of the vows that you made was to protect the peace and the purity of the church, right? To do everything. So, so we, this is language that's, uh, that we're accustomed with. So I want to dig into this today. So the first thing I want to look at here is the problem with unity. Then we're going to look at the power. And then we're going to look at the path. So the problem with unity Unity is killed when we allow secondary issues to fill primary places in our hearts and in our minds. Um, let me remind you of what Paul says in Romans 14, looking at the first six verses here. He says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. 
but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who, uh, who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. How could he eat that? For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or he falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand, no matter what his conviction is on the issue. One person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days are alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his mind. That's the key verse right here in the first six verses, is that our conscience is to be convinced in and of itself, and we're to obey that conscience. He says, the one who observes the day, observe it uh, in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eat in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains the honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So, so what's the problem? Well, we know that the symptom of the problem is disunity in the church. What is disunity in the church? Well, it's when people avoid each other, right? When they see you in the lobby and they're like, oh, I'm going the other way. I can't believe they ate that or they did that or they posted that or whatever it be. Uh, they gossiped and they slandered about one another. The church was dysfunctional because it wasn't unified. So Paul is writing to this church in Rome to address the problem, to remind us of the power, and to help guide them on a path to unity. Not uniformity, but unity. So the symptom was disunity, and the root issue was judgment. He speaks of passing judgment five times in Romans 14. Now, what, what, what you have to know about scriptures, anytime things are repeated, you got to pay attention to those things because they're repeated for a purpose. So he says five different times it's because you're passing judgment on one another. And, and, you know, Christians are called to make judgments, so making judgments and passing judgment are two different things. Passing judgment is different than making judgment because passing judgment is about making a final declaration and an indictment about another image bearer. It's like finished, right? You're done. You've made the decision. And the reason why Christians cannot do this about other believers is that we are all corrupt judges. We're all hypocrites. None of us are pure. That's why we can't pass judgment. In the scriptures, uh, Matthew 13, a, it's, it's called the, the parable of the wheat and the tares. There's all these kingdom uh, parables there. And, and he says, you cannot judge, you know, the wheat from the tares until the judgment comes, until the judge returns, until Jesus returns, because he's the only one, church, that sees the whole and final picture. He's the only one that's omniscient. That's why we don't judge. We don't judge because it's too soon. And we only, as 1 Corinthians 13 says, we only see in part. We don't see the whole picture. We see a slice of one person's life and a slice of God's work in that person's life. And so when we cast the final verdict over someone's life and decisions, we cut out the opportunity for further understanding and further transformation and further connection for us. That's why he says it's so dangerous to do this. Because we're all becoming more like Christ. How dare we reject someone that Jesus has accepted over things that don't even matter in the end? Amen? He mentions this idea of weak versus strong faith. What's he mean here? He's not saying because you're a vegetarian you're weak, all right? So you carnivores, get that out of your vocabulary right now. That's bad exegetical work. He's saying in this context, if you pass judgment on others because they eat things that you don't think they should, and you think they shouldn't be in fellowship with them because of this, you have weak faith. To have weak faith means we're not leaning on being fully justified by the gospel by faith alone. You still think your diet or whatever your, your um, kind of obedience threshold is for whatever issue you're dealing with, you still think that has something to do with your justification. That's what he's saying is weak faith. That we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in the gospel alone, right? That's how we're saved. It has nothing to do with what you eat or you don't eat, drink. Um, obviously, eating to different levels and drinking to different levels of sin, we're not talking about that. We're talking about uh, the, the, the fact of just entering in in general. 
He's saying that to have weak faith is to add, is to say that Jesus plus anything else equals salvation. That's what weak faith is. Faith that says Jesus alone is my righteousness is a stronger faith. And we're all weak in our faith in certain areas. None of us are perfectly strengthened in the faith. We're all in process. Now, if we're trying to envision a weaker Christian in our mind, we must not envision a weaker, vulnerable Christian that's uh, easily overcome by temptation. That's not what he's talking about. But instead, a sensitive Christian that tends to be full of indecision and uncertainty. And we've all been there at some point in our lives if we're not there right now. We're all weak in certain elements of our faith, and we all trust ourselves more than Jesus in certain areas of our lives. And that's what he's talking about here with the weak and the strong faith. The weak do not necessarily lack self-control or strength, but rather a freedom of conscience. Their consciences are just more tightly bound by secondary things than others in the faith. And believers are given this conscience, right, this, this kind of internal guide, this internal compass that's guided by the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures. Now, your, con- your, your conscience can guide you to bad places if it's not guided by the Spirit and the Scriptures, right? You can feel com- when you were an unbeliever, you felt completely fine about doing things that were horrendous to God, right? But now as believers, we're guided by the Scriptures, we're guided by the Spirit and community. So when... when, when so, so believers are given this conscience so that we can move forward in life without overthinking everything. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just overthink a lot of things. It's because my faith is weak in those areas. My conscience isn't clear in those areas. So when we, we think about how uh, this issue breeds disunity in the church, we have to think about a grid for unity. Not everything that burdens us is a top shelf priority. If you're a person that only has urgent, top-shelf priority things in your mind, I can tell you who you are. You are an anxious person, right? If everything you have to go to the mat on uh, in your life, you're going to be anxious. The Lord says that we're not called to have anxiety as believers because we cast it all upon the Lord, as as, uh, Psalm 55 talks about. We have a freedom in the gospel to loosen our grip in some areas so that we can tighten them in the areas that really, really matter. I want to talk about these areas because when we misprioritize our convictions and preferences, this is often what leads to disunity in the church. So uh, I've kind of got four categories, concentric circles, on how I want to think about uh, the priorities of how we're to grip things as believers that are going to lead to unity. There are the essentials that Rod mentioned a little bit earlier. There are the convictions that Rod mentioned, and the preferences, and then there's just the questions, right? Uh, And so I'm going to go through each of these and kind of just give some examples. This isn't going to be an exhaustive list, but I'm going to do my best to try to give you a grid to think through as your conscience is guided by the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit. So the first one is essentials. Essentials, kind of the general idea of essentials is this is what makes you a Christian and provides entrance into the Christian community. This is kind of the baseline of what we're called to believe. We're called to believe that the Bible is a revelation from God, that it is inerrant and is infallible. It's, it's incapable of leading us to, 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 to error, right? Uh, we're called to believe the virgin birth, right? Because we need a sinless Savior that doesn't have the fallen condition of being born uh, of, of, this, of this world. We're called to believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All of God who sent for all of us to save us. We're called to believe that mankind is made in God's image, male and female. Because without that, if we get to decide that, salvation doesn't apply to us, right? The whole thing collapses. So that's a top-tier issue. We're called to believe in the deity of Christ, that he really is God. We're called to believe in the depravity of mankind, that we really are that sinful. We're not just... You know, good people that occasionally slip up. We're corrupt people who need a Savior. We're called to believe that repentance and faith is the pathway to eternal life. Now, our job as Christians is to spend most of our focus and most of our interactions with other believers in this circle. These are the most important things that we all agree on if we are orthodox believers. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that these are areas of first importance, which means they need first priority in our heart. Now, most of the time, when things get really out of control in the church or in our own lives, it's because either we as individuals or sometimes entire churches, right, fail to wait their teaching, they fail to wait their conversations, and they fail to wait their leadership around essentials of the faith. And we cannot have unity without priority and focus here. Amen? So the second thing is this, convictions. Convictions, these are, in general, these are things that help us decide which church to be a part of, to be honest. Which, wh where is it going to be a most easy for me to find the most unity that I can find, right? You're never going to find a perfect church. If a church is, if you find a church that always does things your way, it's probably a bad church, all right? It's not a good church. Our job is to, is to, is to disappoint you at, at a level that you can handle, okay? I mean, that's our job. Just sing enough songs, just preach enough sermons that make you feel good, uh, but also, you know, kind of twist the knife as well. I'm kind of kidding here. So, but, but, but here's some of those things that Rod mentioned, right? Mode of baptism. Like, we don't get hung up on this, but we do have an opinion on that. We're Presbyterians, right? The view of the charismatic gifts. Are we a church that, that believes in speaking in tongues and all the, the miraculous gifts and the healings? And I would say, I'd say we're, uh, we're cautious uh, yet open to all of that stuff, right? We, we believe the scriptures call us to uh, apply that in a certain way. There's a, there's a way to uh, see the, the miraculous gifts alive in the church in a way that uh, is orderly, right? And, and I think we're open to that. Our view of the Lord's table, we, we, we believe that, that Jesus is spiritually present with us. We're not just memorializing and looking back and saying, oh, thank you, Jesus, for doing that. We believe that by the Spirit's power that he's with us, but we don't believe that it's the actual body and blood of Christ, like Catholic Church does, right? Our, our handling of the word, we, we, we preach exegetically through book, expositionally through books of the Bible. We think it's the best way to shape believers. Our model of care and leadership, we have an elder-led church. Gender roles in the church. We, we believe that God has called uh, for male headship in the church and in the home. And we, we teach that way. Uh, we, don't do that, we don't do so in a chauvinistic way, right? Um, but we believe that's what the scripture teaches. Uh, we believe that, that uh, in, in God's role and our role in salvation is that God first moves toward us and we respond toward him, right? We're not convincing him to move toward us, but he sets his love on us and we respond to that. These are kind of the convictional secondary issues that make our church what it is and that make this a fit for you. Now, your theological convictions about God's word tend to help you find the community that unity is easiest for you. It's not really about us, but these are non-salvific issues that there are multiple interpretations of. And we look at these, and we as a church may weight some more heavily than others. You as an individual may weight some more heavily than others, but at the end of the day, we still love one another and can have fellowship and unity um, with those outside of a perfect alignment because these are secondary issues, right? They're convictions, they're not essentials. Now, the third thing is, is the one that probably is the most difficult of all. These are what I'm going to call preferences. This is what we tend to prefer in community with others. And I think this is one of the things that, that Paul was really leaning into with the Romans. He also does it with the Corinthians. And it was a matter of food and drink for them. And before I get into these specifically, let me just share with you what happens. When we're off mission, we take things like these and we force fit them into the first two categories. Okay? And it doesn't mean that these cannot be matters of conviction for you personally. Um, because personally, they can be matters of conviction for you. We're just not going to set that conviction for the whole church. We don't feel like that's our job because when we do that, we dilute the essence of the first two categories that we want to lean into more fully. Um, so we do this when we make things that the scripture is not explicit about dogmatic and immovable. John Stott says it like this. We must not elevate non-essentials to the level of essential um, and make them tests for orthodoxy and conditions for fellowship. That hits, doesn't it? That hits. And we do that a lot of times, especially when we're not focused on the essentials as a church or as individuals. We take these preferential issues and we force fit them in. And we say, we can't be in fellowship unless you're in alignment with me on these things. You know, view of creation and end times. 
there are biblical scholars all over the range of how they view creation, whether it was a literal six days, what the word yom means, all of those kinds of things. There are people all over the spectrum on end times. Yes, we have a conviction on that, but we're not going to just basically make it an entrance exam for you to be a part of this church. Media consumption. What are the types of things that you consume and recommend, right? There's different thresholds there. Worship style, political positions, cultural engagement, matters of food and drink. How social issues are applied to the life of the congregation. All of these things we have opinions on. But when those things are the primary things in this pulpit, we are a church that is off mission. Because there, are, there is a range, there's a range here that we want to honor. This is the Achilles heel to the church in the United States right now. These issues. Most of these things have jumped up a level or two. Now here's the deal. You can have personal convictions about all of these things. And they be more strongly than others in your community. But they are not reasons to break fellowship. Guys, when we, we take in a lot of information as individuals, more than anybody, any, any people in the history of the face of the earth, we take in more information now. And for the most part, these are the kinds of things that can be most divisive in a community when we make them tests of orthodoxy and conditions for fellowship, as Stott says. I just want to be vulnerable with you for a second and let you know what it's like to live in my world. Um, I had something pretty hurtful happen to me a while back. I had a friend of mine question our church's fidelity uh, to the scriptures because we refused to make one of these things an essential thing. He said, if you, if you don't tell the church to boycott that liberal media company that's trying to brainwash our kids, how can you even say that you're being faithful to the gospel? I felt like I was taken hostage and that I had to take something that wasn't clear in here and make it a first-tier issue to make your consciences be bound to that. His conviction, these kinds of things swirl around us. How are we going to make those decisions? Well, luckily for me, I trust that each and every one of you have the Holy Spirit and you have the Scriptures. And you have an ability to make those decisions. And I don't want to dogmatically impose things that are not clear in the Scriptures on your conscience. Because that would be sin for me. The stakes are too high to pollute the message of the gospel with the shifting sands of the culture. The culture that we're swimming in is always going to have matters that we have to discern. We're always going to have to figure out how to be in the world and not of the world. That's not a new thing. The more that we take matters that are constantly evolving and make them our soapbacks, the weaker and the weaker the essential, unchanging, eternal word of God is going to be in our heart and in our community. We desire to be culturally aware and engaged, but not culturally consumed as a church. We get too little time to open God's word together to make this anything other than about Jesus up here. The last one is this, questions. These are things that you're just curious about, right? Sometimes we can just get so hung up on the mysteries of God that we neglect what we know to be true because we're too focused on what God has not made clear. When the reality is, God has intentionally not answered all of our questions. It's not like he forgot, right? It's not that they're not important, it's just they're not essential. Things like this. How long were Adam and Eve in the garden? I don't know, 10 years, 10 minutes. I'm not sure. He doesn't make it clear because it's not essential for our salvation. Did Adam have a belly button? Yeah, obviously, because he'd look weird without one, right? Will there be meat in heaven? I hope so. No offense to my vegetarian brothers and sisters in the room, but a man can hope. Will there be pets in heaven? Only if cats are excluded. I mean, guys, think about this. They got nine lives here. What more could you want? I'm sorry if I offended you. Don't tune me out, please. Strong faith means retaining our own personal convictions without forcing others to adopt our secondary and tertiary concerns. When this happens, this is what makes for a strong and a unified church. So here's the question I want you to, to answer and ask yourself this week. Because I think we all have something to own, right? We're all responsible for this. In what ways, ask yourself this question, in what ways have I intentionally 
or unintentionally contributed to the disunity of the church. What is it that I need to own and I need to change moving forward? What is it that I've imposed upon others in community and made them a test of orthodoxy and conditions for fellowship that are not primary things? Are you someone that tends to quarrel over opinions? You just love to argue with people, right? Have you ever considered the impact that you're having on all of us when you live that way? What does repentance and new obedience look like in light of what God's shown you? Those are questions that maybe, maybe they come to you right away, or maybe you need some time to think about it. But it takes all of us to have a strong and unified church. Each and every one of us has something to own in this because we're all responsible. And we need the supernatural of power of God to live like this. The second thing we see is this. Now that you have the grid, I want to talk about the power to live this way. The, the power is this, is that the unity that the gospel brings makes community possible. Because it's the, most, it's the most amazing thing about the church is that we're so different. We come from so many backgrounds, so many upbringings. So many stories have affected who we are, our families of origin, all those things. And yet we come in here and we sing with one voice to God. Isn't that amazing? How do we continue to do that? We have to have the power that God's given us. Before we were followers of Jesus, our agendas were all self-oriented. We're all about finding a way to make our life work for us. And we have to get our way for life to work, right? The gospel changes us because it reveals that, that, that our lives will never work without Jesus. Each and every one of you who's a believer in this room eventually came to that place. My life can't work without Jesus. And what it does is it forces you to surrender. It forces you to step back and say, I tried it that way. It ultimately wasn't working. I'm surrendering to your way. But the problem is, is that this power is, is kind of a gradual power that's applied to our lives as we learn to kind of undo the things that we, the, the ways that we were living before. And the gospel changes us because it reveals to us that our lives will never work apart from Jesus. And so we're learning to apply the power and the work of Jesus to our lives as we live in community with others. <clears throat> so we have to surrender to all of the ways, eventually all of the ways that we've tried to make our lives work apart from Jesus. Last week we called the ways that we make our, our lives try to work apart from living in Jesus, we called that living in the flesh, Right? So, that, so that's what I'm talking about, kind of tying in with that. So Paul says this in Romans 14, 14, 7 through 12. He says, here's the key. None of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and he lived again, that he might be, he might be Lord both to the dead and to the living. So why do you pass judgment? There's our phrase again, on your brother. Or why do you despise, which means to feel contempt for, or to think they're worthless, your brother? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. His judgment's the one that counts, church. As it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Then each of us will be given given account to himself, to God. So we're either, we either bow our knee before Jesus comes or when he comes. We bow our knee before he comes and we surrender him, we're believers. We have to bow our knee when he does come, we're not believers, right? And so, and so what does it look like to apply this power to us? Well, here's kind of what he's saying here. Because Jesus physically died for us and physically rose for us, we can die to our own preferences in community with others. That's the power. Because he died, we can afford to die. Because he lives we can have faith that we're going to live even though it feels like we're dying. We get to die before we die because we're getting to live before we live, right? Because Jesus rose, we can trust that we too will rise even though it seems like we're, all we're doing is dying as Christians, right? Every knee will eventually bow and everyone in time will be held to account for every selfish action, every careless word, and every sinful priority that you have imposed on God's people. And for believers, all of that judgment that you will be held to account for was poured out on Jesus for you. Praise the Lord. All of it. Every sin that you've committed, that you are committing, and that you will commit was all poured out on Jesus at Calvary. And because of that, 
We seek his face. We seek to be changed by him. True life is really about this. It's learning to surrender and be conformed to the image of Jesus and follow in his footsteps in that humility. Think about the, 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 the purest form of community that there ever was in the history of the church. I think it was right after Pentecost, right? Right after Pentecost, what happened? The Holy Spirit was poured out, right? It's like fresh right there, like first day, right? Scriptures in Acts chapter 2 says, all the believers were together in Jerusalem and they had everything in common. Do you think they really had everything in common that quick? Do you think, do you think that they could figure out whether they should go for Alabama or Georgia? I mean, do you, do you think they had all that figured out, right? Do you think they had all of those things figured out about whether they should make Gentiles be circumcised or, or whether they should, um, you know, what, what kind of foods were safe to eat? We know that they didn't have those things figured out. But what they did have figured out was the essentials of the faith. And that was what made them so unified. But as time has gone on, we have mission drift, right? We have, we have, we have, we, we've drifted into the secondary and tertiary things and tried to put them as primary. <clears throat> because the essentials of the Gospels have to have an essential place in our hearts for the church to be unified. That's our heart for this community. So that's the power. The power is because Jesus died and rose, we can die to ourselves and our preferences for the sake of unity in the church. Now the third thing is this is that there's a path of unity that begins to lay out. And we all have an obligation to do our part to pursue community. I'm going to read these ten verses real quick, and then I've got four just principles that I want to just kind of bullet point real quick as we close out. He says this in verse 13, Therefore let us not pass judgment, there's our phrase again, on one another any longer, but rather to decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself. God made it all. Nothing's unclean. But it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean because that's your conscience, right? <clears throat> and, and this is why I said that sometimes a preference, one of those eating and drinking issues or whatever was in that kind of category, becomes a second-tier issue. That happens to us personally sometimes, right? But we're just not going to impose that corporately as a church. So if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one of whom Christ died. So do not let you regard as good be spoken of as evil. You can have your own convictions, he's saying. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but one of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue for what makes for mutual up. Building. Let's pursue those things, he's saying. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. And when he says for the sake of food, he's thinking anything in those categories, right? Those preferential issues. It is not good to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. He kind of comes back to that, right? You've got to keep your own convictions to yourself for the sake of the unity in the church. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. That's an example of strong faith, right? But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because that eating is not from faith. His conscience is seared the whole time he's eating it. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So four principles real quick here on principles for pursuing the path of unity. First one's this. My conscience yields to your conscience in community every single time. That's, that's, that's what we're called to do here. Because I no longer live to myself, I wear my preferences much differently than I did before Jesus. It used to be my way or the highway, right? That's what it's like to live as an unbeliever. You have to meet my demands. But now I look to pivot and to yield to others' convictions whenever necessary so that I can pursue the greater good of a unified church. For him it was eating certain foods and drinks. For us, it might be the same thing or it might be something completely different. We're all called to be looking for ways to pursue unity through our own sacrificial yielding of our preferences. We don't make demands of others, but we also don't allow others to make demands of us on non-essentials. It goes both ways. We should be looking to yield as God's people. The second thing is this. 
The quality of my brother's faith is in part my responsibility. So when my liberty in Jesus causes my brother to be weaker and weaker in his faith, and I'm aware, and I refuse to adjust it, it's my sin. It's not his sin, it's mine. When I open a bottle of wine in front of someone who struggles with substance abuse, my sin. When I choose to watch a racy show and recommend it to a friend without considering the implications of temptation, it's my sin. When I blast social media with political memes that belittle others who hold contrary views, that affects the unity of the church. The bottom line, if it doesn't lead to mutual upbuilding, Jesus doesn't care what the Constitution of America says. His word says we do not have freedom of speech. We do not have the liberty to speak about things that tear his church apart no matter what country we live in. And friends, sometimes we just have to adjust to have self-control and to let things go. The unity of the church is at stake. Brandon asked me to share this story with you. Uh, when we first started the church, he was very involved in politics, no surprise to some of you. And he felt like it was his role to influence others on how to vote and challenge people online and so on and so forth. And one election year, I noticed uh, that he posted something online that took a pretty bold political stance that I knew several people in our small church would disagree with. And so I decided that I, I felt like I should challenge him on it, uh, which is a scary thing to do. But um, he received it well. I, I said, I know you have the right to say it, and I might even agree with you politically, but have you considered how saying it so flippantly online might affect your ability to pastor certain people in the congregation? He later told me that he was very convicted in his spirit about that. Now, he didn't change his political views, but he realized that his well-intentioned words on social media were not building up the kingdom of God. And for that, that was a miss. And it's making him more, more and more challenged to live in unity in the church. But I know for a fact that he connects with many of you that might disagree politically. Because why? Because he chose to lay down his right to say whatever he wants for the sake of something greater, which is unity in the church. And that's what I'm asking all of us to be willing to do. The best place, number three, for our preference-oriented conviction is between us and the Lord. Paul says it twice in Romans 14. He's saying that we can keep our freedom to ourselves, not because of shame, but for the sake of unity. There's a certain liberty that each and every one of us are invited to bask in in the gospel. And getting to the place where we refuse to even judge ourselves. And you can have that and you can still be unified in the church. But we must differentiate our freedoms from our identity in Christ so that we can focus on the essential bonding characteristics of the gospel in this community. Lastly, we seek to live from a biblically informed conscience. So if we're in a situation where we feel forced to fit in, but we're actually going against our conscience, that internal kind of compass that we have, that can be sin for us because we're not acting from faith. The places I've had to learn how to obey my conscience have been around issues of food and drink. They've, I, the other places I've, I've, I've had, I've had to, I've had to uh, learn how to obey my conscience in matters and how we choose to spend money with how we choose to uh, engage uh, with certain media or not engage in, in which some of our f close friends do engage in, right? And how we set boundaries with our family. Those are all things that I think are significant for us, but those are between our family and ourselves. I'm not going to impose that on anyone else. And the list goes on and on and on. We must walk personally with Jesus, obeying our conscience but seeking how we can do our part to build others up and trust that he's going to carry us to the end. Rupertus Meldinius once said this, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. Hey, Pastor Ryan here. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us and watched one of our online sermons. Our vision as a church is to live as the family of God together, proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of grace to one another in our city. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church, we'd invite you to attend one of our in-person worship gatherings so you can experience all that God has for us as a community of believers on mission.